All right, we want to welcome you back to our um, series, When You're Running the Wrong Way. I want to welcome our online audience who are joining us right now. Glad to have you guys with us as well. Last week, if you were here, um, we were looking at the story of the life of Jonah. And uh, if you remember the story last week, Jonah ran from God, which never ends well. Uh, Jonah, God had a job for Jonah to do. Jonah thought he could run away from God. And if you remember the story, he ended up on a boat and uh, in the middle of a storm, and finally he was thrown overboard. Um, but God didn't leave him in the open ocean. Uh, God had a fish swallow him, and uh, we sometimes we go, that really didn't seem like a good thing, but it was actually God's way of saving him. And uh, last week we talked about the fact that, uh, you know, when we finally stop running from God, he comes running to us, doesn't he? And uh, we talked about the idea that that was God swallowing Jonah with his love. And that's what God does to us when we stop running away from him. When we take one step toward God, God runs to us. And uh, last week we left him there. We want to pick up the story of Jonah now in Jonah uh, chapter 2. And we want to talk about uh, kind of what happened next for Jonah. Now, I, I want to I say this before I, I read this passage of scripture from Jonah 2. There is something worse than having a disaster. How many of you have ever had a disaster? Okay. How many of you would be honest enough to admit that at times, like Jonah, you have made your own disaster? Okay. There's something worse than having a disaster. There's something worse than making our own disaster. It's not learning from our disaster. And that's what I want to talk about today. How do we not waste these broken world experiences that we had like Jonah. We want to look at uh, Jonah chapter 2. If you want to take your sermon outline out, out of your worship folder, you can uh, track along, take notes, or doodle to keep yourself awake, whatever works for you. Um, this morning, I want to look at Jonah chapter 2, and what I want you to listen for is, as I read this text of scripture, I want you to listen for the attitude of Jonah's heart. I want you to listen to what's going on inside of him now uh, that he's, he's realized I'm, I can't get away from God now that you know, I've kind of made a mess of things. I want you to listen to the attitude of his heart because that kind of sets up the next events after this. You ready? Jonah chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. This is from the New International Version. From the inside of the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. And he said, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. Aren't you glad that in your distress you can call upon the Lord and he will answer you? Regardless of what you've done, regardless of where you've been, regardless of what has happened to you, God's eye is always upon you and God's ear is always tuned into you. Amen? That's huge. From the deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths and into the very heart of the seas. And the currents swirled about me. All of your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. <laughs> I love that. Let's just be descriptive here, Jonah. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath me. Uh, barred, me, uh, barred me in forever, but you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. What a great testimony. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it spit Jonah up on to dry land. I love this story. I want you to notice uh, in this time of prayer that, uh, that Jonah had, that there was a brokenness in him, that there was an openness in him to what God was up to. Um, now, this is real important. When I, when I was looking at this story and I was, um, I was just kind of unpacking the life lessons that it has for us, this kind of really jumped out at me that the difference uh, in, in, in people's lives really has to do with how they respond to disaster. 
Disasters happen to all of us uh, by our own making and just simply by life itself. But the difference between people really has more to do with how we respond to that. Uh, And as I was laying this out, I thought, you know what? We're all going to have them, but let's learn how to not waste a disaster. Amen? Let's learn how to not waste it. I love this quote from, uh, from Henry Ford. Throw that up on the screen. Read it out loud with me. Failure is the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. It's an opportunity to begin again. How? More intelligently. I, I, was, reading a, I was reading a story a while back. There was a, a, a guy in uh, New York City who had, uh, was waiting on a subway, and he was, as he was waiting on a train, he stuck his head out to see if the train was coming, uh, and he was coming, and it hit him in the head and knocked him out, knocked him unconscious. He ended up in the hospital for a few weeks. What was interesting was in the article it talked about the fact that that very thing had happened to him a year ago. <laughs> and, and you go, you know, you go like, okay, how many times do you have to put your head out there before you go, you know, that's really not a good thing to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, th- that's what we're talking about. When, when we have a disaster, we can't go back and undo the disaster, but we can learn how to begin again a little more intelligently than we were before. Um, as I was thinking about you know, how people respond to disasters, and I was kind of thinking about going back across my own life and the times when I've kind of fallen flat on my face and how I've responded, I, I realized that there are certain attitudes that we kind of develop sometimes that really block the kind of lessons that we need to, to, to learn. And I want to give you then, you can you kind of pick your, your pick your own out, but five different attitudes that if you have these kind of attitudes, you'll waste this disaster. Are you ready? Here's the first one. Blaming. Blaming. Come on. How many of you have ever blamed someone else for a mistake you made? Oh, hold your hands up. I know you have. How many married couples do we have in here? I know you guys do this. Yeah, yeah. It's your fault, your fault, your fault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's so easy for us when, when something happens to try to find someone that we can pass the blame off onto. And whenever we do that, you know what? We miss it. We just miss what, we're, what we really need to learn from this. Uh, this is really good. Throw, this, throw that picture up on the screen for me. That's Harry Kakovas. Um, Harry uh, made a fortune in Australia uh, in home development in the Gold Coast area. When you think of Gold Coast in Australia, think of Southern California. It's kind of a, a lot alike. Extremely expensive housing, uh, extremely expensive area in Australia. And the guy just made a gazillion dollars uh, doing this. But Harry had a problem. Uh, he was a gambling addict. And he loved, he loved to gamble. Um, he was known to uh, go into a, a casino and sit down at the Baccarat table and bet like $100,000 to $150,000 per round. I mean, he had just would, would throw money away. And he, he lost, this was really sad, but back in 2006, 2007, over a 16-month period, Harry lost, if you can imagine this, $1.5 billion gambling. One and a half billion with a B. Now, Harry, um, Harry got upset uh, because he was losing all of this money. And uh, finally, Harry decided, you know, it wasn't his fault. And so Harry, no kidding, Harry filed a $35 million lawsuit uh, against the Crown Casino in Australia, claiming that they took advantage of his addiction. That was his lawsuit, that they, they took advantage of his addiction, that you, you, you knew uh, I had this vulnerability, and yet you let me come in and gamble anyway. And uh, Larry, uh, uh, Harry, you know, got hired lawyers, and it, it, it went to trial. What was interesting, and I really loved this, because sometimes this stuff can really go sideways in, in the court. You never know. But I, I loved it, because when the judge ruled uh, against Harry in this case, he said, Harry, no one came to your hotel and put a gun to your head and made you leave to go to the casino. No one drug you inside that casino. No one took the money out of your pockets and put it on the table. Harry, you did all of these things. As long as you blame the people around you for the messes that you're in, I promise you, you'll never get healthy, you'll never get better, and you'll never really learn what God wants you to learn. Amen? There's another one that that hit me, and some of you will get this. Uh, It's 
It's shaming. Not just blaming, but, but shaming. This is for those of us that when we mess up, we really internalize it. We become our own worst enemy. We start beating ourselves up. We, we move into this mode of, I didn't just make a mistake, I am a mistake. I didn't just fail, I am a failure. And when we move into shaming, we give up. Um, we, we think that the root cause of this is because I can never learn, I can never be any different because my failure is who I am. Look at me, and that's not true. Can I tell you the really good news of the gospel of Christ is that God never gives up on you, no matter how big of a mess you've made. Amen? And when we get into shaming, we really don't do ourselves any good. There's another one that, that you know, I, I'll bet you can at least uh, identify with for some friends that you've had. If not for yourself, it's, it's victimizing. Victimizing. Anybody ever know anyone who's always the victim in a story? Yeah. You know, you know no matter what, whatever's going on, they're the victim. If they, if they went to the, you know, if they bought something at a store and brought it home and tore it up and took it back and the store wouldn't take it, it's because the store has something against them. You know, not because they tore it up, but because the store has something against them. They're, they're a victim. And, and this is what happens sometimes even in life when, when, we, when we really screw up. You know, and, we, and we're, we're flat on our face. We, we go, you know what? Uh, you know, life is against me or, or people are against me or God is against me. And whenever we make ourselves out to be a victim, if you, if you move into a victim mentality, this I can promise you, you're just going to move from victim circumstance to victim circumstance and you're never really going to grow and learn from the things that happen to you. You'll waste every disaster in your life. There's another one. It's minimizing. Minimizing. There was a guy, you may have seen this in the news, I thought this was such a great story. There, a couple weeks ago, there was a guy in Abilene, Texas, uh, he was watching TV, and his TV started messing up, and it was really windy um, in West Texas, as it is in Oklahoma, and he realized that probably some of his cables had come loose, and so he needed to tighten them, and so he goes out, and he's going to crawl under his house to check the connections with the cable. And so he, there's a crawl space under, under his house. And so he, he takes a flashlight, and he shines the flashlight under there to, to see where the cables are. And when he's shown the flashlight under his house, this is what he saw. How many people afraid of snakes do we have here today? <laughs> yeah, he looks under there, and he sees, anybody know what those are? Yeah, those are rattlesnakes. Those aren't really guys that you want to mess with. And so he, he's from West Texas, and he's not really afraid, afraid of, of snakes. But he sees them in there, and he's smart enough to go, I don't think I really want to crawl under there. And uh, so he, what do you do, in, you know, when you're in Abilene, Texas, and you have snakes under your house? Well, you call big country snake removal. That's what you do. <laughs> It's really a company. I have no idea. But he calls big country snake removal, and uh, he tells them, this is what I thought was hilarious, he calls them and he says, I've got, a, I've got a few rattlesnakes under my house. Could you come get them? Key in on that word. Few. Okay? Throw the next picture up on the screen. Throw the next picture up on the screen. Look at me. There were 45 rattlesnakes. Forty. Five rattlesnakes under that guy. How many of you guys are going, I'm moving? <laughs> snakes can have the house. I'm gone. You know? Well, th that, was, that was the deal. And I, I cracked up laughing when I'm, when I, when I'm I mean, I'll, I think if I'm the guy from big country, you got, oh, I got a few rattlesnakes. You know, you come out with a little pail, you know, you, and you can actually go on, you can go online and watch the video of the guy crawling under the house, removing those things. I mean, it was real, some of those things were like five and a half to six feet long. And he's removing those things under there. But I'm thinking, you know, here's a, here's a guy who's a minimizer. <laughs> you know, I got a, I've got a few snakes under my house. No, you got 45, dude, 45, you know. Now, what I want you to understand is that a lot of times our reaction to the, to the things that we do is we try to minimize it. We try to make it out to be it's not as big a deal as it is. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not telling you you need to blow things up bigger than they are. But if you're a minimizer, if you, if you are minimizing the consequences of your disaster on yourself or on the people around you, again, if you're minimizing it, you're never going to really fully learn the lessons that you need to learn. Um, let me give you one more. You may not be familiar with this word, but I'd, it was the best word I could find to describe it. Throw that up there for me. It's placating. 
placating. No. Okay, Pastor Steve, what in the world does placating mean? It, look at me. It means simply this. Placating is confession without repentance. Placating is if I've hurt you and you're confronting me with that hurt, I'm trying to just say something to get you to stop being mad at me. I'm not really taking owners taking ownership for what I did. Does this make sense to you? I, I had a conversation with a husband um, years ago, and I was talking to him. He had hurt his wife uh, pretty badly, and he um, was talking to me about, you know, she's not getting over this. And um, he was telling, he said, Pastor, tell me, what do I need to say to her for her to stop being mad? And I looked at him and I said, that's where you're making the mistake. She doesn't want to hear your words. She wants to hear your broken heart. Does this make sense to you? You see, as, as long as you are just trying to find a way to weasel out, then you're never really going to learn what it is that you need to learn. Um, there, there is a brokenness, like we read about with Jonah, there is a, a brokenness that needs to happen to us on a, on a deep level for us to really learn the lessons that God wants us to learn so that we can fully embrace it. Does this make sense to you? Okay. Well, those are the attitudes that I, that I think will, will, will waste your disaster. Let me give you some things that will really help you. No matter what you're going through, it will really help you process it in a way that I think you would really want to get the most out of it. You ready? Here we go. Let me give you four. These aren't easy, but they're all important. Here's the first one. You, you need to be ruthlessly honest in examining yourself. You need to be ruthlessly honest in examining yourself. How many of you hate seeing pictures of yourself? How many of you really hate seeing videos of yourself? Yeah. It, it's so funny to me how uh, unwilling we are to, to really look at ourselves. I, I think I may have shared the story before, but it was, I, it's just, it was so hilarious to me. Um, I had a youth pastor uh, in Phoenix that um, was, a, he was brand new to us. Uh, our youth at that time had a, uh, their own worship service uh, during one of the services, and uh, he was a speaker. And as, a, as his supervisor and his coach, I wanted to try to help him to be a really good communicator. And uh, since I was never in there, because I was in, in adult church and couldn't, couldn't be in there, I, I asked him, uh, after a few months of working with me, I, I asked him, I said, well, I want you this Sunday to videotape yourself, and I want to watch the video with you so that I can, we can, I can help coach you on how to be a good communicator. And he said, okay. Well, that next Monday, I buzzed him in his office, and I said, hey, uh, you got that video for me? And he goes, oh, you know, I forgot to do that. And I said, well, okay, well, typical youth pastor. That's fine. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do this again. <laughs> you notice I'm over here, so I'm not getting too bad. <laughs> yeah. I know Will would trip me if I was over that way. Yeah, not, not, not Will. Will would never do that. But, but so, so I said, okay, well, we'll, do, we'll look at it next week. And um, next Sunday, the you know, same thing. I told him, you know, get the video. Well, Monday, I, I buzzed him again, and guess what? Oh, you know what? I got busy. I just forgot to do it. And it happened like three or four straight weeks. And uh, finally, after the last Monday that I, I buzzed him, after three or four times, I, I, just, I, I went down to his office, and I said, can I talk to you a second? He said, sure. And I, I closed the door, and I said, um, can we be honest? He said, yeah. And I said, you really don't want to do this video, do you? And he dropped his head, and he said, no, I don't. And I said, it's okay. You don't have to. I said, you, you don't have to do it. And he looked up, and he was, wow, thank you. I said, but here's the deal. You don't get another paycheck until I see a video. <laughs> it was amazing. That next week, I had a video. <laughs> We sit down, I kid you not, we sit down to watch this video, and uh, we, we put it in, and he's sitting beside me, and he, he comes out, and it was so funny, because he was really kind of an intense kind of guy, and, and very upbeat, but he came out like this in front of the youth, and he began to talk, and he never left his voice at this pitch, he kept it here the whole time, and he looked like a really bad used car salesman, you know. <laughs> he thought he was being energetic, and what he was being was really annoying, <laughs> Now, what was funny was like, I'm, I'm serious, I kid you not, no more than a minute and a half or two minutes into this video, he is literally on his knees with his back to the screen going, turn it off, turn it off. Sometimes it hurts to see yourself. Look at me. But it's the best way to get better. 
Do you realize that if I had never made him watch himself, he would have never become better at what he was doing? Now, the best thing that you can do when you, um, you know, have a, a mess up in life, when a disaster happens, whether it's if you're making or not, one of the best things you can do is sit down and ask yourself the question, how do I, what do I learn about this? What do I learn about me? What do I learn about how I handle things? What do I learn about life? Or what, what, what lessons do I think? It's, it's Psalm 139. It's David saying, Lord, search me and, 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 and know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any wicked thing in me. It's, it's God. Help me see me as you see me so I can learn from that. Does that make sense? You know, we often make this statement, experience is the best teacher. And that's not true. How many of you know people who have made the same mistake at least a dozen times in their life? Yeah, it's not experience. I love it. Throw this up on the screen for me. Experience isn't the best teacher. Evaluated experiences. Evaluated experiences. I, I love this from Proverbs, from the, the uh, version called The Voice. It says, real motives come from deep within a person as from deep waters. Read it with me. But a discerning person is able to draw them up and expose them. A discerning person is able to do that. I wrote this in my notes, and I just thought this is a good statement for you to take home. Throw that up on the screen for me, would you? The difference between people who learn and people who don't has more to do with teachability than intelligence. If you're not learning, it's not because we're not capable of learning. It's because, frankly, we really don't want to learn. Now, let me, let me go one more step with this. How do, we, how do we gain from this? Now, this one is going to be a stretch for you, but invite some wise, honest friends to share their forensic analysis with you. A forensic is what you do after the fact. Uh, when you're looking at it yourself, you're doing a, a forensic self-analysis. When's the last time you ever invited some people to look at something with you for their forensic analysis to help you get better at it? Now, on your outline, remember it says, invite what kind of friends? Wise and circle that on your outline. Circle those two words. Here's why. It doesn't do you any good to invite stupid people into this room. How many of you know some stupid people? Yeah. How many of you are sitting beside you on the pew right there? Yeah, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Now, we, we have so you both arms and a leg up back here. We don't, sometimes we have people that we know, we, we know that they're not good at this. We don't invite, look at me, please. Don't go on Facebook and go, can I get your collective opinions on what I ought to do in this disastrous relationships. I, you know, I, I'm on Facebook. I post my daily devotional on there, and sometimes I scan things. I'm amazed how dumb people can be. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's like the, the lack of intelligence has gone to a whole new level in, in, in our culture. I mean, I'm, I'm reading these things. Again, I'm a pastor. My wife's a therapist, and I'm pretty good at relational stuff. And I'm what, listening, reading the advice that people are giving other people, and I'm going, this is really bad. This is really bad. It doesn't, you, you need wise people. Secondly, you need honest people. Now, here's the deal. Most of us, when we're going to ask opinion from someone, we, we want someone who's going to tell us what we want to hear. Now, I, again, some of you have some people, like, come on, it's just us. But some of you have, you have like me, people in your life, they, they'll, they'll never want to hurt you. They'll never want to hurt you. And so they're going to be very gentle, they're going to be very kind, they're going, to, they're going to tell you everything that you want to hear, but probably nothing about what you really need to hear. And here's what I want to say to you. Every single one of us needs some people in our life who love us enough to tell us the truth. Amen? Every single one of us needs some people in our lives who love us enough to tell us the truth. Now here's, here's what other people can bring you. Other people can give you perspective. Um, you know, my wife is the polar opposite personality for me. Um, I'm outgoing. She's more reflective. Um, I'm a risk taker. She's a very uh, security conscious person. Uh, she's very thoughtful. I'm very intuitive and impulsive. And can I just say, she makes me crazy sometimes. <laughs> but I need her. And I need her analysis 
in my life. Um, every once in a while, I need someone who's more thoughtful than me. I, I need someone who's more reflective than me. And as irritating as sometimes it is to have people who are different from us, when we bring other people to the table, their perspective gives us a much, a much broader view. Does that make sense to you? We need the objectivity of other people. Sometimes it's really hard when we're trying to look at something that's gone, gone awry for us because we have so much emotions involved in it. Sometimes we need people who bring more objectivity to it, who can give us thought and reflection because they're not emotionally involved. The other thing that people can give you that we really need sometimes is they can bring you, they can give you hope. They can give you hope. Um, when you've seen someone who's been through what you've been through and they have emerged successfully, those are great people to talk to. Because they'll not only be dead level honest with you about where you are and what you need to do, they can give you hope of how, how you can rebuild after that. Does that make sense? I love, let's go, a couple of great passages of Scripture for us for, for you to just kind of keep up, keep in front of you. Throw the one from Proverbs. Proverbs 27, 6, would you read it out loud? Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. So true. Throw the next one up from James, James chapter 5, verse 16. Read it with me. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now look at me, just to hear my heart again. Sometimes we want to keep these disasters all to ourselves. And, and what I'm going to tell you is that sometimes in order for us to really be whole, we need to be able to bring those out for other people to hear. Let me give you two more pretty quick. Here's, here's the, number, the third thought I want to give you. Lean into the brokenness, not away from it. Lean into the brokenness, not away from it. When you touch something hot with your hand... What do, you, what do you immediately do? You pull it away. Pain is a gift from God. Pain is God's way of reminding you you don't really want to do that again. Okay? I um, always love what Mark Twain said. You know, he said, you know, if a cat sits on a hot stove, it won't sit on a hot stove again. It won't sit on a cold stove either. <laughs> that cat's just going to learn you need to stay away from the stove. That's a great, that's a smart cat. You know, that, well, that's the same thing for us. And, and the problem is in our human nature, whenever we're dealing with something that we, where we failed particularly, we don't want to feel the pain. We, we want to escape it. And so we want to get past it as quickly as possible. And so rather than really take it apart and lean into it and, and let ourselves feel the, feel the guilt and, and feel the pain and feel the loss and, and, and talk to other people who may be involved to, to kind of feel how it impacted it, we, we, want, to, we want to try to sprint through it. But that, that doesn't help us really understand the depth of what we did. I love, throw the passage of Scripture from Corinthians up. I love how Paul said this. Paul said, the kind of sorrow God wants, it makes people change their hearts and lives. And sometimes in order for that kind of sorrow to take place, we, we've got to go deeper. And again, when I was writing my notes, I put this down, throw it up on the screen. Most of us want to just move on when we failed, but the deepest learning comes from the lingering. You know, if you've ever... Um, been in recovery. Uh, there's a 12-step program that you walk through, and the first part of it, I think, kind of everybody embraces pretty easily, and that's to acknowledge our, our lives are unmanageable and out of control. And all you got to do is end up in the belly of a whale to realize my life is unmanageable and out of control. It's not hard. I need a, a God. I need someone. I'm in need of a God who can help me. That's not too hard either. But then you start going into the reflections where you do this fearless moral inventory of yourself. And you're looking at yourself. And that's really hard. But then as you keep going, you get to this place where you, step eight, where you, I, I, I make a list of all the people that have been hurt through my addiction or behavior. Do you have any idea how painful it is to think about all of the people in your life that you've hurt in circumstance? Because every person that you think about inflicts another wound on your heart that you have to experience. And then you, you take step nine where you go, I'm going to make amends to the best I can to each one of them. 
Do you have any idea what it's like to sit down with person after person and let them tell you how your behavior hurt them? Can you imagine as, a, as an alcoholic father listening to your wife and listening to your children and listening to your friends all tell you how, how your behavior hurt them so deeply? And it's like, why in the world would you put yourself through this for this reason? You never want to forget how bad it hurts. Because you not only don't want to sit on a hot stove, baby, you don't want to sit on a cold stove either. Amen? Lean into the brokenness, not away from it. Let me give you one more. Surrender fully to the work that God wants to do in you. Surrender fully to the work God wants to do in you. Now, here's what I mean by that. Sometimes when in the aftermath of a disaster and we're asking for God's help, we, we want to let God, uh, we're asking God basically to fix the circumstances, but not necessarily change our character. Asking God to do more than just patch up what's around me, but God, would you, would you change what is within me? That's a little harder and it takes a little longer, but that's the real work that needs to be done. God, I need you to fully do this. Uh, throw that passage up on the screen for me. Or that say, this is from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis says, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our consciences, but he shouts to us in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse the deaf world. In other words, you know, when do we hear God's voice the clearest? It's, it's when we're in pain and we really need to hear God's voice and we need to hear fully what he has to say. Throw that passage up from 1 Peter. Peter says, read it with me out loud, would you? If you will humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God in, God's time, in his good time, he will lift you up. In his good time, he will lift you up. Yeah, what happens to us so often is we want to humble ourselves before God, but we want to get up off our knees really quickly and go on with running our lives. Peter says, no, 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 you humble yourself for God. You humble yourself, and you stay there flat on your face before him until he lifts you up again. I have, a, I have a good friend that's a pastor who in the last um, 18 months or so of his life has been through the, the hardest stretch of life he's ever had. Um, he's had uh, health issues. He's had uh, family issues. Uh, he's had ministry challenges. Um, there have been times in the wake of all that he's gone through that he's just, he's wanted to quit wanted to give up. It's, it's overwhelming at times. But as I've walked with him over these last uh, several months, it's, it's been interesting and exciting to watch God work in his life in ways that he's never had God work before. And I, I was talking to him recently, and he said something that just absolutely blew me away. We were we were talking, and he's, you know, well down the road, and, you, you know, the things, are, things are really going well right now. And I, I said, so, so how are you doing? And he looked at me, and he smiled, and he said, you know, I'm doing good. And then he said this, and it, it startled me. He said, but I don't want to rush through this. I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, he said, as painful as this is, this has been really good for me. And here's what he said. He said, Steve, I don't want to miss one lesson. God has for me. Did you get that? I don't want to miss one lesson that God has for me. Pastor Steve, how do I, how do I not waste a disaster? It's fully humbling yourself before God and asking Him to fully and completely in every area of of your life teach you what you need to learn. Amen? You can't prevent every disaster from happening. But when they do happen, it's up to you what to do with it. Look at me. There's something worse in life than having a disaster. It's not learning from that disaster. Let's not waste it. Amen. I want you to take a moment just to bow your head and close your eyes. And, and uh, in a moment, I want to I just close this out in prayer. And there may be, there may be some of you this morning uh, that are going through a, a tough place. 
uh, you're uh, at a tough place and you need the help of God, you need the healing of God. Uh, some of you may be uh, kind of on the aftermath of really going through some deep stuff. And, and maybe this morning as I was sharing, you were saying, boy, this is for me. I, I want to make sure that I learn every lesson that God has for me in this. And in a moment, I just want to pray. But before I do that, I, I wonder if there might be some of you that would just want to slip up your hand and say, you know what, Steve, I'm, I'm walking through some stuff and I really need the help of God. I'm, I'm going through some things. I really need the wisdom of God. Or, or maybe you're one of those saying, you know, Pastor Steve, I'm, um, I'm, I'm coming out of some stuff, but I, I really want to make sure I don't miss what God's trying to say. If that fits for you, just slip your hand up wherever you are and just say, Pastor, that's me. Yeah, that's me. Remember what we said last week? When we stop running from God, he will run to us. James 1 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men freely. Let's make that our prayer this morning. Father, as we come before you, we confess. That we sometimes fall flat on our faces. Sometimes, Lord, we, we make a mess of life. Um, sometimes, like Jonah, we hear you coming and we run the other way. Sometimes we uh, let our own desires and things get in the way and we, we, we make a mess of our lives. We, we hurt ourselves. We hurt other people around us. And, and sometimes, God, kind of like Jonah, we end up flat on our face and we look up and it's just a disaster. Well, Father, I pray. I pray for each and every person who was bold enough just to raise a hand a moment ago. and You know exactly where they're at and what they're going through. You know exactly what kind of help they need today. Would you wrap your arms around them? Would you give them strength? Would you give them wisdom? Would you let your grace wash over them? Lord, would you remind them today that uh, a disaster is what happens to them. It's not who they are. And that even people like Jonah who run hard the other way, your arms of grace are open to them when we stop running and turn our hearts toward you. And as they cry out today, Lord, would you just meet them right where they're at today? Would you give them insights about themselves as they, as they do some hard reflecting on this? Would you surround them with some people who can assist them and guide them and speak into their lives to make them better? Would you, would you help them to be courageous enough to lean fully into all the emotions and all of the pieces of brokenness that are there that, that they might fully learn the lessons that they need to learn? And God, would you help each and every one of us to fully open our lives before you? We don't want to miss one lesson that you have for us. Teach us, God. Help us not to waste this mess that we've made. Lord, we love you so much this morning. Help us to go out and to walk in your grace and your truth, we pray. In Christ's name we ask. And everyone said, amen, amen. Deep breath. Hey, great to have you with us this morning. So glad that you were here. If you are new or nearly new, uh, I'll be out by the Welcome Center. I'd love a chance to meet you. Don't forget, if you haven't signed up yet for the Newcomer's Welcome, make sure you do that. That's next Sunday after church. I think we still have some empty eggs that need to be filled. Let's make sure we get those taken care of as well. Love you guys so much. Have a great week. God bless you.